All right, so the meeting will come to order. We're waiting on a couple of folks, but we may be able to just kind of skip through the presentation a little bit and, uh, and, and get started. Um, so just a, so a couple of preliminaries. Um, we're probably going to hold uh, meetings about every month, kind of through the interim. Um, we have a couple of tasks, some of which started this in the legislation this year that we'll be dealing with starting next month, which is talking about task forces and uh, working groups and stuff and, and the executive branch and whether we need all of them or not. And so that'll be part of the agenda for next month, at least identifying those. Um, uh, and then um, kind of moving on, but if people have ideas about things that they'd like to, to talk about too, you certainly let me know or let Kate know uh, and we can start to build that into the, into the agenda. Um, Senator Han. Did you? Okay. Sorry. I couldn't tell if you were <laughs> wanted to say something. Um, so why don't we get, uh, get started uh, with uh, an update. So welcome Commissioner Showalter uh, and Dr. Stinson um, and Dr. Colum Bacatis. Is that how it is? Colombo Ketis. All right. Colombo Ketis. All right. Why don't you, if you all want to come up to the, and, and get started, that would be great. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, appreciate uh, the opportunity to come here and testify today. I wasn't realizing we were going to be first, and this is a good thing because um, I think we got some good news uh, and a uh, good opportunity to walk through some of the things that we're going to do. Um, for the record, my name is Jim Showalter, Commissioner of Minnesota Management and Budget. Can I just jump in one? Quick, I forgot to do the minutes. Can we just get that done before we get in? Chairman. Representative Dave Moose, uh, adoption of the April 5th minutes. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? The minutes are adopted. All right, thank you. Absolutely. And uh, it, the presentation here today uh, is going to address a couple of different things. Uh, and it really takes on a, a, a chance to step back from the day to day work that we do uh, here in the legislature in the Capitol. Um, in state government to s assess where we're at and what's happening in the state. Uh, Tom, Laura, and I, I had an opportunity to do that just uh, the other week in talking with rating agencies and prepare some of the materials that you see here in front of you today. Key among those uh, sort of uh, realizations or reflections as we look at it is that the state has done many, many things and many, many good things in the last few years to try and adjust to the economic recession and the impact that it's had on the state and to shore up its finances and <coughs> refocus, I think, our efforts and continue to focus our efforts on making sure that Minnesota is the kind of place uh, that continues to outperform the nation. The number of questions that came up in previous years were often about whether Minnesota had the um, ability to withstand uh, the impact of the recession because it did have a significant impact on our revenues. Uh, whether we had the capacity to uh, adjust as we needed to and ultimately whether we would snap back once it was all over. And uh, I think this presentation and some of the questions about the shift uh, will, will demonstrate that yeah Minnesota has taken really extensive Move, made extensive moves to repay the shifts, to replenish the reserves, to make our books and put our books in better shape, and at the same time has done that as the economy, uh, and in part because the economy has gotten better and uh, it continues to perform well. On page two, what you'll see is uh, just that off of the cover sheet a summary of the financial outlook. And from that, what you'll see is really that we are doing well on the short term. The first bullet point says that July estimated revenues were about $463 million above forecast. So just the current news, the news that we're giving you on a day-to-day -day basis is generally positive, that we're doing exactly what you would want to see, which is understanding what the risks are and hopefully our economy is doing better. And 
that is in fact what we reported to the rating agencies. But what's also unique about Minnesota is that we use that good news and that positive revenue very directly to repay ships. So that on the next bullet point, we've had a history and a discipline of repaying shifts and this last legislative session took it one step further to say that the closing balance of FY13 will be used to accelerate repayment of those shifts. So that the $463 million that we know about already will be adjusted at closing, probably get bigger, and all of that will be used to repay the school shifts. That's a financial discipline and a action that helps us in many ways, helps our schools helps eliminate some of those one-time actions that we've had to take during the recession. And the next bullet point points out another part, which is our, our overall books called a gap statement, which is uh, the accrual view of what's happening in the state. Our obligations, our long-term, our obligations and our, our current resources. And, and, and those have significantly improved. And I'll have a chart a little bit further in. As well as the cash balances. I've been in front of this committee in other times looking for flexibility on managing cash because we didn't know or didn't, couldn't project that we would have enough cash on hand just to make our payments some month. That is eased substantially because of the changes um, that have been made. And finally, uh, that even for all that good news, the repayment of the shifts with the current at the end of the year balance does mean that we won't have that as part of this next forecast. So when we do the next forecast, when Dr. Colin Bakitas comes forward in November to give you the new economic projections and the new revenue projections, we won't be adding to that any kind of benefit, the 463 that we used in that first bullet point. The commission uh, asked about uh, the school shifts and uh, asked for a little bit of information on that. And I think the key thing here is that more than two-thirds of the school shift has already been brought back. That we've already reserved, restored the reserves of $890 million and paid back about $1.9 billion in school shift since November 2011. Just in 2013, over $1.5 billion was paid back. Again, through that existing current law mechanism that makes sure that when we have forecast surpluses, that gets used to uh, pay back shifts and now is going to be augmented with the uh, legislation from this uh, past year so that the 2013 balances will go directly towards repaying the shift. There still remains about $870 million in education shifts that are still there, 287 in school payment, and, and uh, as well as property tax recognition shift. But those numbers are before we do whatever we're going to do with the close of 2013 balances. I think it is extremely likely if not almost certain, that the school aid payment shift will be eliminated once we get to fiscal year closing. We will apply those revenues and we will then be starting to pay back on the property tax recognition shift as well. That is where we're at right now. Uh, any, any presentation from us though uh, would just not be complete with a couple, without a couple of fund balance kind of uh, uh, charts or a couple of charts with a bunch of numbers on them and this is the first of them. It looks at the statutory allocation of forecast balances and so by year you'll see uh, in the November 2011 forecast going through to the 2013 February forecast how the balances have been used and allocated to restore the reserves, pay back the shifts, um, and over that period of time. One of the things that I, I like to point out uh, to uh, rating agencies is that this is a long-standing practice. This is something that Minnesota does. We pay back our obligations. We pay them back quickly. And so even as they had concerns about the state as we were utilizing the shift, we knew, and I think they knew, uh, as, that Minnesota has several times now made sure that shifts are repaid quickly, and that these practices are institutionalized and a priority for the legislature as well as for the governor. So uh, we've made significant progress uh, with $2.8 billion being paid back in the shifts and really getting us to a point where uh, we are, are taking care of those one-time obligations. What shows up 
on the next graph is how that, that gap deficit that I mentioned before really is strongly affected by the use of shifts. You think of a shift, it's basically saying we'll pay less than the front end of an education entitlement and we'll settle up the next year. Well, that means that the state is carrying an IOU, an obligation for the next year. The gap deficit basically says, well, you don't get to just forget about that IOU. You might have a positive fund balance, but you've got an IOU that we're going to set against that. So as we started to use the shift, you see in the middle of uh, around 2007, 2008, 2009, that number starts to drop significantly. And it's really largely due to the effects of having payment shifts, where each year we would have more of those IOUs that would show up in the statements that rating agencies would see that show up on our uh, GAAP statements. Since we've reversed that, you see the opposite happening. So while we bottomed out in fiscal year 10, in fiscal 11 we started making progress. In fiscal year 12 we're going to make progress. I would expect in fiscal year 13 we're going to more than break even because at that point we will be recognizing the significant more than a billion dollars that's being repaid in those shifts as well. That's a very strong point. It's a very strong point. It was one of the, and that gap balance is one of the things the rating agencies were most interested in. Are we managing our money wisely? Are we piling up IOUs for the future? or not. And clearly Minnesota is not. Clearly we're paying those things back and putting ourselves in a, a, a much, much better financial footing. That is um, the, I think the key message uh, of, of where we're at right now. The <clears throat> state has done what it needs to do to pay back those shifts to really re-emphasize that um, this past legislative session and to get us to a position where uh, we are meeting our ongoing revenues with our ongoing expenditures and not having structural deficits, that we are taking a look at the aggregate books and being able to say, yeah, we don't have any IOUs that we're not showing on our cash balances, and that we're taking on the business of the state. That's a uh, the stress of the recession, the stress of many things, you know, uh, occurred in Minnesota and other places. And uh, what we're seeing now is, I think, our practices and our habits paying off for the state and putting us in a much better place um, for us all. That being said, uh, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Stinson and Dr. Kalambakitas in just one second, because one of the things that we also emphasize is the, the, the premise, importance of information. That you want this information, that everyone wants this information, and that's part of the basis that decisions are made. And we've got a very strong tradition internally within the state, but also externally in terms of the kinds of information and questions we bring to bear on what's happening. Dr. Stinson has done a spectacular job of raising questions and plaguing issues before they become, uh, so that we have a chance to act on them. And that it's, and it's before it becomes too late to act. Uh, whether that was in this most re recent recession, whether it's in looking at some of those very volatile revenue sources um, and helping us understand how we deal with them, uh, whether it is in the in-depth detailed knowledge of the economy. And so having Dr. Stinson there again for this uh, last round and helping us prepare this July economic update was, again, a tremendous thing. And I think the respect and the perspective that he brings has always been an important thing. Being able to bring Laura along as well, Dr. Kalabakitis, is a, a great opportunity to sort of pass the torch. And in some respects, this hearing is an opportunity as well to uh, help them know, them being the rating agencies, but also, in this case, probably the LCPFP that MMB in the state continues to really focus on an independent economic forecast that's professionally done, that provides questions and our best answers to those questions so that you as legislators can make decisions on that information. So uh, that's sort of a quick <coughs> summary of uh, some of the things I wanted to raise for the audience today. Representative Holberg. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and, and Commissioner. With uh, you stated that that um, money 
for buying back the shift would be sent out once you uh, you adjusted at closing. What's the timeline on it, that, and will that spending be attributed to the last biennium, or will it be chalked up in this biennium? Mr. Shoulder, Mr. Shoulder. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Representative, I, I don't think we've got a firm close date yet. Uh, the law does say that one, even if we don't have close in place, we will have to make that estimate by September 30th. Um, the whether that spending will be chalked up, uh, this will adjust the aid payments uh, for fiscal year 14. So what will happen is we'll make a, uh, a payment, uh, sort of a, a larger payment, I think, in the month of September, and then continue on through the formula. Uh, in subsequent months. And if I might, Holbrook, yeah. just for clarification purposes, the September 30th date is related to the language on the payback of the shift, not your traditional process for having your adjusted numbers. Is that correct? Commissioner Schultz. Sure. Representative, that's correct. And if I might, uh, when do you generally have your adjusted numbers, and is this uncertainty a function of the accounting system or? Uh, why is there not more certainty as to when this would occur? <laughs> Commissioner Showalter. Mr. Chair, uh, Representative, uh, closing uh, typically happens uh, a couple of months after the end of the fiscal year. And it's really uh, a process where, uh, and, and it's no longer than usual. It, what it is is an opportunity for agencies to double check whether there's open encumbrances, obligations that have been made, but don't in fact look like they're going to get liquidated. Uh, whether that, that making sure that they've got their numbers in place, and, and that process of closing accounts, moving money like federal money across here, things like that, uh, just take some time. And so, that fiscal close is typically where the, the number, the starting point for the subsequent forecast. And I'm sorry, just Reverend one Reverend. more clarification: Do you, as an agency, set a backstop date? Uh, we know some people are prone to procrastination, et cetera. I mean, what role does your office play in saying we will close? you know, come hell or high water by this point. Commissioner Scholl. Uh Mr. Chair, uh, Representative, uh, my office does, uh, through the accounting uh, division, set a date uh, based on talking with the agencies uh, and, and really a, a pretty routine schedule uh, of what has to happen over that period of time. Uh, it is really an extraordinary event, um, like a systems implementation, where that date is really called into question. Otherwise, we've set that date and everyone works towards that. And Mr. Chair, I'm sorry, but has that date been set for this process this year? Commissioner Schultz. Mr. Chair, Representative, I don't have, I don't think so. Um, it's usually in August, um, I, and I don't think we've got a firm date. Uh, I will check during this hearing and I'll let you know yet during this hearing if I can. All right, thank you. Okay. Uh, doctors, I'm, Dr. Stinson, are you going to go first? So, and we should probably acknowledge, thank, uh, this may be your, this may be probably your last hearing. You maybe didn't even expect this one, perhaps. No, I uh, actually but, didn't. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but thank Chair. you for, you know, from all of us for all your years of service as well. Well, Mr. Chair. Yes. After this, he can now come as a citizen That's and tell us what he really thinks <laughs> about what we do. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Stinson. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee, what I'm going to do is uh, review real quick, quickly with you the economic update that we issued on July 10th, uh, and that will include uh, a discussion of the revenues that uh, we have, the revenue variance that we have uh, for fiscal uh, 2013, and then a little bit on the U.S. economic outlook. And then Dr. Kalmokitis is going to cover some recent data on Minnesota's economy. Let me start out by saying, as the commissioner said, uh, this is a good story, uh, but I wouldn't be an economist if I didn't caution you not to get too euphoric about uh, the results that we have, uh, because the situation is complicated, and actually things may not be quite as good as uh, they appear. That, if we turn to um, page uh, seven, what you can see is that we're uh, uh, 463 million dollars, or 2.7 percent, uh, above forecast. Now that was uh, on July 10th. Uh, 
it's almost certainly better news than that. Uh, we uh, have, we're, it would be almost impossible for us not to be over $500 million uh, uh, positive in here. Uh, could, we could be as much as uh, 525 million. And that, can I just, I'm sorry, and that would be as of July, June 30th? That would still be uh, for fiscal uh, 2013. Okay. And the issue is on the revenue side, which is also part of closing, is that there are revenues that come in after the, uh, after June 30th, uh, but still are attributed under accounting rules to the prior fiscal year. And so there will be some of that going on. And just from what we know right now, it looks like uh, there will be uh, a substantial amount of revenues come in that uh, we didn't think we would have. <coughs> uh, if you look at the table real quickly, uh, you can see that the corporate income tax uh, was $124 million or 10% more than we thought. Uh, that's good news. It means that uh, corporate profits in 2012 uh, were higher than we thought. The sales tax is uh, 33 million below what we thought. Uh, some additional revenues come in that was attributable to uh, tax year or to fiscal year 2013. So that's now uh, less than 20 million dollars down. Uh, and then uh, the big item is the individual income tax, which is $335 million more than was forecast. There are two pieces to the individual income tax, and uh, one of them uh, is what's going on with respect to current economic activity, what's happened to withholding, and what's happened to estimated payments for tax year 2013. Withholding in uh, in the economic update we reported uh, was uh, $90 million above uh, forecast. Uh, now we think uh, it's more than $100 million above forecast. Uh, estimated payments in June were extremely high. They were at record levels. Uh, they were $47 million more than uh, we thought they would be uh, in there. So uh, in terms of what's going on, uh, and what we would say uh, is a current measure of the economy, uh, both uh, withholding and estimated payments are doing well, which would indicate that Minnesota's economy is, is doing well. The second part of the income tax, though, uh, if you turn to uh, page 8, uh, is also interesting. What the, in, in, in July, we report not only how we're doing on current, the current economy, but also uh, how settle up payments and refunds and payments accompanying uh, requests for extensions uh, are matching up compared to the forecast. And here you can see that uh, what we have is we have uh, final payments being five million less than uh, we thought they were going to be, but refunds being 59 million less than we thought they would be. So that's 55 million dollars to the good. And then payments accompanying extensions were 136 million dollars more than we thought they would be. And so uh, there are, in total, uh, those payments that are settle up payments for tax year 2012 were 191 million dollars above forecast. Now, those of you that have been around here for a while, and all of you have, know that uh, typically uh, what happens is that if we have an increase in the payments, uh, the settle up payments, that means that there's an increase in the liability. That means that we have a higher base level for uh, tax liability going on into the future than we thought. And so it's one of those gifts that keeps on giving if you're $200 million plus for the prior tax year that raises the base for the next tax year by 200 million and the next tax year, so on like that. And so that would normally be what we would think. This time that may not be true. And the reason why it may not be true is because of what happened in uh, December uh, with respect to the uh, Bush uh, tax cuts on uh, higher income individuals. It was well advertised that uh, 
the uh, tax rate on high income individuals was going to go up. Uh, capital gains tax rate was going to go, the effective tax rate uh, for individuals uh, was going to go from 15% to 23.8% as well. And so it's logical to think that there may have been some acceleration. People, for good reason to save on taxes, would move income that they would have otherwise taken in 2013 and moved it into the last part of 2012 selling stock that they would have sold earlier, taking a bonus early, uh, exercising options early in there. Uh, in the simplest case, if all of that $191 million is simply the acceleration, that means that we will take $191 million out of two th tax year 2013 uh, liability and that in November uh, this will just be a wash. Now, it's probably not likely that all of this was accelerated, but certainly some of it was accelerated. And the key is going to be uh, figuring out uh, how much it was uh, uh, that was accelerated. That's going to be a key challenge for the November forecast. And it won't really be until the February forecast that we have the data necessary to do a good job on that. and so that there could be pretty significant changes between the November forecast and the February forecast uh, because it won't be until February that uh, we have the new sample, the new preliminary sample that tells where the, the uh, revenue actually came from. Uh, that's going to be a key challenge for the forecast. Let me turn to uh, page 9 and uh, just give you a little bit of reassurance about uh, the U.S. economy. If you look at the uh, dark line and the lighter colored... So can uh, I just ask one quick question? I'm sorry. Sure. So we're about 200 million in that section, and you take the 200 million plus the sum, what, over, what was 90 million in, on July 10th from just more withholding in 2013? Does that get you close? Is that, is that kind of additive to get to this 335? Is it really kind of those two pieces? Uh, Can yes. We correlate? Okay, so this page 8 kind of is the other piece aside from the 2013 withholding. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Generally Chairman. Generally speaking. Mr. Chairman, the of that 335 that's on page 7, uh, 136 of it uh, comes from uh, settle-up payments. I'm sorry, 191 of it comes from uh, settle-up payments and uh, and uh, extensions, payments of company extensions. And so it's not quite 50-50, but, but it's 40-60. Right. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if uh, you look at page 9, uh, you can see uh, how the economy is doing compared to how it was forecast. Uh, this shows Global Insights July forecast, the dark line, and uh, their February forecast, the lighter colored line, you can see that there's not really very much difference between them. Uh, this really, at this point, uh, wouldn't make a lot of difference uh, to the economic forecast. If you look at the bars, you can see that there's not much difference in the growth rates uh, in there either. The big difference is between uh, the February forecast and the November forecast in the second half of 2013, in February, uh, the, uh, for, the forecast was 2.8 percent growth. Now it's 1.8 percent growth. That change is not due to the economy being necessarily weaker going into the second uh, half of the year. Uh, what it is is it's a change in the assumptions that uh, Global Insight used with respect to the sequester. Uh, in, the, in February, Global Insight was assuming that the sequester issue would be resolved uh, by the end of the summer and we'd be back on a normal path. Uh, almost all of that drop uh, between uh, the February forecast and July's Global Insight forecast is due to assuming that the sequester continues on until uh, January. They're still assuming that some uh, something is done that the that the situation is resolved in some way, 
by January, uh, if that if that assumption changes, uh, then uh, the first uh, half of 2014 will be weaker as well. <clears throat> There's some news coming uh, the latter part of next week, and it may be portrayed by uh, the media as uh, the economy is suffering more than we thought or something like that. Uh, a lot of people now think that uh, we could have economic growth, real economic growth for the second quarter at uh, less than one percent, uh, maybe even less than a half a percent. Uh, I wouldn't, I, I don't want you to, to uh, think that that's uh, a bleaker picture uh, than it actually is. Uh, there are a lot of things going on that uh, don't necessarily affect uh, uh, the economy as ordinary people uh, know about it. And there's always the likelihood of revisions. Uh, the numbers that come out uh, next week uh, aren't complete. Uh, they have plug numbers in them uh, for several items that uh, will be changed uh, uh, by uh, when the second report comes out uh, in August. Uh, and at this point, uh, I think the thing that's important for you to do is to uh, keep your eye uh, on uh, what's going on with jobs. And over the last uh, six months now, uh, we're averaging close to 200,000 jobs a month uh, for the U.S. And that's, that's good news. That's, that's a good performance. And we've seen uh, strong performance, especially over the last quarter. Uh, with that, let me turn it over to Laura, and uh, she's going to uh, talk uh, about the job outlook in Minnesota's doing. Yes, sir. That's Senator Cohen. Maybe before that, if I can ask Dr. Stinson a question, if that's okay. And, and Dr. Stinson didn't realize I didn't get a chance to ask you any questions again, but uh, uh, just if you'll, if you'll allow me, Mr. Speaker, uh, at, at Dr. Stinson's retirement party, the comments I made were that uh, years have been around here. Uh, he is the single most valuable person I've ever run across in state government. So to echo your remarks, will be. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm sure Dr. Kalanatis will do a, a great job as the su successor, but we're really going to miss Dr. Stinson. So getting one more chance to ask you a couple of questions. Um, what, you talked about the sequester and, and the fact that uh, Global Insights is now projecting a little bit of a, of a decrease in the GDP as a consequence, but uh, assume that that will be taken care of by January. But if we look at the news out of Washington from two days ago with the discussion of um, uh, the, the debt ceiling and a government shutdown, which um, I don't speak for the uh, uh, Federal House Republican Caucus, but would seem to me to maybe have a little bit more seriousness in terms of the President and, and the House Republicans not uh, reaching an agreement, what potentially does that do? Um. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Senator Cohen, it doesn't do anything good, I can assure you. Uh, but the implications of that, uh, just in terms of national income accounting, aren't as dire as one might think. Uh, what, as long as, well, the, the pure economic implications. If people react to it and people get uh, uh, very discouraged and people begin to pull in their spending and things like that, we could have uh, another difficult time. Uh, but uh, extending the sequester uh, through uh, 2014, uh, what that does is that takes a little bounce out of the economy that would have otherwise uh, been built in uh, by uh, uh, having the sequester drop, uh, but we already have that uh, weakness uh, built into the economy uh, already, and so it's not like the economy is going to turn down. It's more like it's going to stay on a more level path rather than going up. But Mr. Chairman, Senator Cohen, relative to that, it's funny you've made it clear that that it's not as if it, it it drops the economy back into a significant recession, but for our purposes, in terms of of uh, small bumps along the way. Um, so hypothetically, what happens if there's not a resolution either to the sequester uh, or as opposed to the government shutdown, what happens if, in fact, the uh, uh, 
the debt ceiling authorization is not passed, uh, and maybe it, even if that's resolved after, say, a month or something, uh, if if there's a market disturbance or something of that sort, does that have any kind of an impact? If they actually go over that uh, that uh, statutory uh, cliff, uh, Mr. Chairman, Senator Cohen, uh, failure to e extend the debt ceiling to raise the debt ceiling uh, would be a serious uh, uh, failure. Well, would create serious problems. Uh, almost certainly, uh, more ratings. Uh, more one of the other two rating agencies would lower the U.S. Uh, credit rating, and that uh, by itself would create a fuss in the financial markets because uh, some uh, financial institutions and so financial, uh, uh, well, financial institutions uh, have requirements that uh, they have to have so much of AAA credit uh, or they can only uh, uh, invest in AAA credits and the U.S. Treasury would no longer be a AAA credit. So that would cause uh, disruption in financial markets, higher interest rates, and certainly would uh, uh, create a problem for consumer spending as well because it would attack consumer confidence. I think that what's going on, although I'm sure I read the same articles that uh, you read over the last uh, uh, few days, I think what's going on is more posturing rather than uh, something where uh, people are actually believing that it would be a good idea to hold out for uh, uh, some issue and, and have the U.S. actually uh, uh, fail to uh, uh, extend the debt ceiling. The debt ceiling, as you know, should have been, uh, well, was extended until mid-May, and then what we have now is we're in a situation where we're using up the flexibility that uh, the Treasury has, and by uh, uh, late fall, that flexibility is, all, is going to be all used up, and so uh, there will be problems. It's not like there's a, a big buffer zone uh, that's there uh, after uh, October. Representative Davis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Dr. Stinson, uh, in the uh, July economic update, uh, we s see that there's an increase in individual income tax coming, and we figure about around roughly half of that is because people accelerated in, into 12 income instead of 13. On the $124 million uh, extra on the corporate income tax side, how much of that was accelerated with corporations bringing income forward into 12? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I don't want to give you the impression, first of all, that the uh, $191 million is all due to acceleration. It may be that none of that's due to acceleration. It may be that all of it's due or some, some intermediate amount. And that's something that uh, will be determined in the forecast in November. Uh, and so uh, that's a that's a big question mark for the for the November forecast and the February forecast. With respect to the corporate income tax, uh, none of that is acceleration because uh, the corporate tax rates weren't changed. Okay, okay, um, Mr. Speaker and and uh, Dr. Stinson. You mentioned that going from the November forecast to the February forecast, there would be significant changes. Would those significant changes be in the downward? Uh, downward, it, it wouldn't be upward because I happen to think that there a lot of this uh, on the individual income tax si side was accelerated. I I know, I'll guarantee you, some of it was. Um, I can guarantee that. Uh, I can too. You can? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Just personally, I mean, I see these. What I did in these. <laughs> I see what I did with these numbers myself. Um, uh, that that being all those numbers are yours. About half of it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, with, with that being said, I, I think we, I think from November to February there would be a, a decrease because I know very well that a lot of this is an acceleration of twelve because people with the uncertainty didn't know what was going on and they, I, I had people cashing in IRAs so they could dec declare it in twelve rather than thirteen and, you know and and so. When would we have any idea of what the decrease would be from November 
of, of uh, 13 to uh, February of 14. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, you, it's important to remember that in November a forecast will be made and the forecast will take the best information that uh, is available at that time and forecast how much of it was acceleration and how much of it was economic growth that uh, just hadn't been factored into the forecast. That forecast could be too optimistic or it could be too pessimistic and we will get the data uh, that allow us to do a, a better job on it uh, in, at the end of January. But there's no reason to think that it will be either down or up uh, because the forecast uh, uh, could be absolutely right or it could be too pessimistic or it could be too optimistic. So part of this is just a forecast uh, issue uh, and we won't know the facts until uh, later, well, until early February. One of the concerns that we have is that uh, high income individuals often, some high income individuals uh, are allowed to uh, delay uh, filing until after November 1st. And uh, so we have to make an estimate always of uh, what uh, income, what liability is going to be for those high income individuals that file after uh, November 1st. Uh, this year it's likely that there are going to be more of them and that's where the big acceleration is going to be is in the very high income individuals. And so while we will do our best uh, to uh, come up with an estimate of, of what's going on, that, that could be a, a difficult estimate to make as well. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Or is it doubt? Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker and Representative, or excuse me, and Dr. Stinson, uh, just a quick question on the unemployment numbers on slide 10. Um, the, uh, those are based on number of jobs, right? Not, not an unemployment rate? Yeah. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, I think Dr. Callum Bokitas is going to cover that uh, in a little more detail. Oh, okay. So I'll let her Maybe I'm jumping ahead. Sorry. Okay. Uh, Representative Carlson. Yeah, um, Mr. Chairman, uh, looking at uh, slide seven or page seven, the reduction in the sales tax of 33 million. Um, last night on one of the major news outlets, they were talking about consumer confidence still being quite low or dropping. Um, does consumer confidence get built into the forecast? Um, Dr. Stinson. Chairman, uh, Representative Carlson, uh, consumer, there are, there are two measures of consumer confidence. One is called the Consumer Sentiment Index. It's put out by the University of Michigan. And one's the Consumer Confidence Index. It's put out by uh, the Conference Board. Uh, Global Insight, as part of its uh, uh, forecast for consumer spending uses the consumer sentiment index that comes out from the University of Michigan. The consumer sentiment index, and I don't know what has happened in the last day or so uh, in there, I, but uh, the consumer sentiment index actually is up quite a ways from where it was uh, a year or two years ago and is maybe not quite at normal levels, but certainly not in uh, precarious territory uh, or anything like that. And that's one of the things that's helping the economy along uh, at this point is that consumers uh, are feeling good about the economy. Back to uh, Senator Cohen's question about uh, uh, the effect of uh, uh, failure to uh, extend the debt ceiling and, and things like that. That's one of the places uh, where we would see a shock that would drop down and then that would cause consumer spending to drop down. And uh, we would see reductions in the sales tax and reductions in the sales tax forecast. The $33 million is um, probably, uh, well, is almost certainly uh, going to be reduced that uh, 
that variance is going to be reduced by uh, accruals that we've gotten money uh, just after the 1st of uh, July. Um, but the $33 million also is probably attributable to the miserable weather uh, that we had uh, earlier this spring as well. A number of uh, national retailers have commented that uh, consumer spending has been held back um, by uh, uh, poor weather, rainy weather in particular, uh, over that time. And so uh, it's conceivable we may even make some of that up uh, in the next uh, couple of months. And I should uh, point out, Mr. Chairman, I think that was a Gallup poll, which would be different than the kinds of research you're talking about. Uh, so uh, I understand what you're saying. That Michigan poll is probably the one that would be the most accurate in terms of the reality versus a public opinion poll. Yes. Thank you. Person Murphy. Thanks, Mr. Chair. And um, Dr. Stinson, it's, it's nice to listen to you talk about the weather. In, in the context of the forecast, <laughs> the economic forecast. Um, you have uh, often come here uh, and talked to us about what we're facing, and you've generally been conservative in your advice, but you've also often given us advice about what we should do given what we're facing, and you've often talked about education. And so I am wondering if, before you go today, you could just one more time remind us about why it is wise to invest in, in education. Um, and what it means for uh, the economy in our future. Please. Uh, Dr. Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Murphy, uh, the short, and I'll give you just the very short version, uh, is that uh, the economy grows in two ways. Uh, one is you have more people making stuff, or the other is that uh, each individual worker makes more stuff per hour or more stuff today, and that's really what we call productivity. Productivity is the key to economic growth looking out into the future because the workforce isn't going to grow very fast over the next two decades. And education is the key to productivity. If you're better educated, you're going to be able to make more stuff, make more higher valued stuff as well, and that, that's what's good for the state's economy. Thank you. So, uh, Dr. Klimakidis, is that right? Yes. Both? All right. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, thank you. Um, so we're on uh, the chart on page 10, uh, and this chart is one of two to just talk a little bit about jobs in Minnesota. The chart depicts the percentage change in employment for Minnesota in the United States since the um, start of the recession, December 2007. So this is a long retrospective view um, of jobs numbers. And so it's from the start of the recession until 2013. So the bars that are closer to zero, are those are the, um, the industries that are close to the, our pre-recession levels. And the bars that are above zero, those are industries that are above our pre-recession levels. The far left-hand bars show total employment changes over the period for the United States and Minnesota. Um, the 0.0, .0 the red 0.0, .0 indicates that Minnesota employment is, is very near our pre-recession peak. So we're, very, we're just a little bit below that now. So we've regained almost all of jobs lost during the recession, while the United States is about three quarters of the way back. The rest of the chart shows the differential effects across industries, uh, selected industries during that uh, during the same period. In most industries, except for trade and other, uh, Minnesota's job recovery has been stronger than the United States recovery. Even so, we notably remain behind our own pre-recession employment levels uh, in both manufacturing and construction. Construction being the first, um, and manufacturing the second there. Uh, you know it's a slow process, talking about construction, you know it's a slow process to get back to consistent demand levels uh, in construction. We do have some signals at the moment, however, that home construction uh, is on the rebound from very low levels and that builders are getting ready to put some people back to work. Uh, residential uh, building permits, they remain less than half of what they were uh, when Minnesota's market began to turn down in 2006, but this spring's residential building permits um, are up more than 50% over a year ago, so that's um, potentially a positive sign. From the chart, if you look at some of the other industries, you can also see that a lot of the credit for Minnesota's um, job market recovery uh, goes to the um, 
uh, health and private education sector. So that's the tall bar with the 12.3% increase for Minnesota. And it's just labeled health, but it's health services and um, private sector education. Hmm. Uh, and also the professional and business services sector to the left of that one. Both uh, sectors um, which continue to be important for the state. The difference in the percentage change for the health industry between Minnesota and the United States looks pretty small, but it actually represents a lot of jobs um, for the state, about 488,000 jobs or 18% of our total employment. Um, year over year, that sector has grown by about 12,000 jobs or almost 3%. Professional and business services accounting for about 13% of our total employment is about 15,000 jobs larger than it was last year. Um, and to just briefly switch from that long retrospective to more recent news, we know that monthly jobs numbers can be volatile, so we don't want to uh, hang our hats too much on any given um, uh, single month's data. That said, the monthly numbers that we've gotten for the first half of this year reflect a good underlying growth trend. Uh, in May, our job growth over the year was uh, reported to be at 1.7%, placing us 13th among states for 2011 to 2012. Um, I'm sorry, 12 to 13 job growth. Thanks, um, and hi. How are you? A couple of questions. Um, where is the ag sector in this chart? Uh, I believe that um, I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, uh, oh, members sorry. of the committee. Um, where is the egg sector? I'm not sure. Okay, I'll get back to you on that. That Mr. would be Chairman, great. Mr. Uh, Chairman, this is, this is what's called the payroll employment okay. survey. And so since farmers generally aren't on a payroll but are are in our small proprietors they're not included in this there are a few agricultural workers that are working for wages and salaries uh, in there but it's a, it's really immaterial thank you and one more question mr. chair thanks mr. chair um, what falls in the bucket of business services generally speaking <coughs> that's business oh, I'm sorry Go ahead. Uh, mr. chairman uh, uh, members of the committee, um, that's business and professional services. So it's administrative services, it's, it's all manner of professional services. Do you have a question on this one or something? Uh, you want, whenever you want. Sure. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, and I, I think, well, my question earlier was this is based on number of jobs, not, not jo uh, and I, I thought that was correct. Um, it's, it, just to, and maybe it's just an observation on my part. It seems a bit alarming. We're, you know, still down quite a bit in construction and manufacturing jobs. Um, mm -hmm. So, I don't know if you do you have a comment on that at all, or uh, Dr. Kalimbakitis, <laughs> Mr. Chairman, um, members of the committee. Uh, that I, I don't. I wouldn't say alarming. I mean, we. It's certainly notable, which is what I what I said. Um, it's um, a matter of matter of concern the as I said the construction industry in Minnesota turned down sooner than the United States we you know we had a lot to make up uh, and uh, I think there's some positive uh, positive, sign, positive signs going forward but we are doing better in those in terms of recovering in those industries than uh, a lot of states are do you know what the percentage was where it bottomed out uh, so this Mr. is Chen showing where we are relative to the beginning of the set recession but presumably that's on an up curve now right so um, do you know what the percentage loss mr. chairman the, I don't know that okay. but I can get back to you on it no. okay. and, and mr. chairman uh, Rep, uh, Senator Cohen um, mr. chairman and and dr. Clement Kiedis, uh, the two sectors on, on this graph where we are underperforming the country are trade and other mm -hmm. and so I'm just uh, I'm wondering what uh, kind of jobs comprise those two areas and um, and if you can suggest why we're underperforming uh, compared to the national trend, as opposed to every every place else, whether it's a negative or a positive, we're ahead of the national mm -hmm. trend. Yeah, Dr. Columbia. Mr. Chairman, um, the other in, the other includes um, uh, leisure and hospitality, and it includes, I believe, mining and some and other extractive industries. Uh, and in terms of trade, I I believe that we typically don't don't perform as strongly relative to other states in um, in that sector. 
So I think this is just uh, representative of how we usually, how our, how our industries are usually distributed. And then how about the other sector? Yeah, um, Mr. Chairman, um, the, the other, the, the, the industries that I recall being put in that sector, and we, we put them together that way, um, were leisure and hospitality and other, and I'm sorry, and um, the extractive industries. And we've actually, you know, we've been adding jobs in those, uh, in those industries. It's, we're just not quite up to what the rest of the country is doing. Okay, go ahead. Oh. So, Mr. Chairman, to continue on to slide 11, which is the unemployment rate um, that, uh, that you know, sort of a com brings us back to this long retrospective view. Um, this is uh, Minnesota's unemployment rate relative to the United States. Uh, and uh, just to be clear, it is an unemployment rate, and so it does, uh, it is the, the num you know, it's affected by a number of people moving in and out of the, the labor force. Um, Minnesota's unemployment rate typically tracks 1.2 or so percentage points below the United States rate, uh, but the current situation, the June 13 situation, gives us a gap of 2.4 uh, percentage points, which is unusually large. Um, so our unemployment rate is further above or below the United States rate than it usually is. Um, the unemployment to population ratio gives a similar picture, uh, simply that it's usually uh, a, of a similar distance from the, from the U.S. rate, um, and that rate uh, edged up recently to 67.2 percent, which is the highest it's been since 2009. Um, nevertheless, about 154,000 Minnesotans who would like to be working are still without jobs. Um, some, finally, a couple of uh, rankings that you may have seen uh, released this summer uh, brought us some positive attention for um, our performance last year, so the 2012 performance. At the end of 2012, Minnesota ranked sixth among states for personal income growth, 4.4% um, annually compared to 3.5% for the United States. Um, and we tied fifth in BEA's rankings of state GDP growth for 2012, which was 3.5%. Into, for 2012 over 2011, compared to the 2.5% for the U.S. average. And some of the industries that contributed to that GDP growth were durable goods, finance, and real estate rental and leasing. Um, unless you have further questions, I can turn it over to Commissioner Showalter, who will sum up. So just one, so that kind of inf the information you just had and this unemployment rate information, so Global Insights projections are, you know, to for some slowdown in the second half of this year and then mm -hmm. actually doing a little bit better than the February forecast going out into 14, are we going to be doing, would we expect ourselves to be doing better than that because we're, we're outperforming, you know, so as we kind of look forward here? Mr. Chairman, uh, committee members, one, one of the things we do in preparing the forecast is that we look at the Global Insight um, forecast for the macro economy, and then we kind of drill down to the Minnesota economy and look at how Minnesota's economy differs from the composition of the U.S. economy. So there might be industries that are doing um, particularly well that feed into global, or, or poorly that feed into Global Insights forecast, but that are uh, are of lesser or greater importance to Minnesota's economy. And so we make we make judgments that way. So we've got the, we start with the macro model, and then we create a Minnesota model of the economy. Commissioner Schwab. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, uh, I'll wrap it up. Uh, the in summary, uh, a couple of things that really stand out as you look back at uh, Minnesota and its uh, uh, budget situation. The first is that over the last several years, so we've prioritized rebuilding reserves, repaying school ships from a place where we had virtually no reserves and had uh, several billion dollars in obligations and school ships. We've prioritized that and made sure that as the economic recovery started, that we use that good news. Uh, to help repay that uh, as a result. Uh, it is, we have every expectation that the aid payment shift will be repaid uh, for this upcoming fiscal year. Beyond that, uh, we've made timely and permanent action to address the budget gap so that we are balancing the 2014 and 15 budget years as well as maintaining uh, an approved outlook for the four year period so that that structural balance, which um, is one of the hallmarks of Minnesota budgeting, taking a longer look at what's happening, um, also uh, has a, a positive balance between revenues and expenditures. 
So that's before you take into account the impact of inflation. The employment and personal income growth that you see uh, here in Minnesota and are experiencing is still um, better than what most other states are experiencing and uh, most other states would happily trade uh, for some of the information on the economy um, that you're hearing about in terms of unemployment, job growth, um, and, and other things that are happening in Minnesota. We're still committed and even as we're transitioning um, our forecasting our responsibilities, I, we feel uh, that the institution of forecasting and long-range budgeting is vested in all of us over here. And I appreciate uh, the support and continued interest in questions that come to us at MMB. Um, you know, we will continue to work through those uh, in, to provide you information, starting with the closing, um, which will be August 16th. Uh, the low exposure uh, to OPEB uh, liabilities is something uh, that Minnesota also has done well over the, the past, making sure that we don't take on long-term commitments that aren't funded. Uh, we have a relatively good um, position in terms of that other post-employment benefits um, liability that some of the jurisdictions do have. Um, and we have relatively well-funded pensions, again, compared to some other uh, public entities. That, uh, combined with conservative fiscal and debt policies, uh, leaves us in, I think, a, a, a very strong position. Uh, the rating agencies are looking at us as we are preparing to issue debt for general obligation bonds and uh, looking forward to uh, continue to give you more information as we uh, learn more about what's happening here in Minnesota. Representative Dow. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker uh, and Commissioner Showalter. Um, back to the to the school debt you mentioned, um, and I think the last time that I spoke with you, you were headed out to meet with the uh, whoever does these ratings uh, about our financial situation. Um, and I guess my question is about uh, on the school shift. I know we've we've uh, taken some action to pay that uh, down. Um, with the surplus revenues from the last budget, um, was there concern on their part that, uh, um, and, and what I mean, I guess, is that uh, in, in, you know, we're going to pay that the remaining surplus revenue from the last budget in September now instead of November. But uh, really, we didn't take action in the legislative session to pay off the remaining balance. Um, was there concern on their part that uh, that we were not doing that? Uh, you know, especially in light of the fact that we're spending about, you know, 10 percent more. Uh, new spending in our state budget. Commissioner Shaw. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative, no. I, I think the pace that Minnesota has repaid those school shifts, replenished the reserves, is really quite aggressive and stacks up favorably uh, compared to other states uh, in reestablishing our financial footing. Gives us some space again to manage risk in the future and gives them, I think, confidence that uh, that's a priority. Minnesota's fiscal management. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Commissioner. I think, I mean, I think real clearly for a variety of reasons. If you take this last biennium and this next biennium, you see um, a complete uh, change in policy, and that we had one biennium with no tax increases, lowest spending increase. I think in state history. Um, we saw nice recovery, reserves, uh, payback of the shift without raising revenues. Um, this last legislative session we've done a 180 in that um, now according to your uh, latest consolidated uh, fund statement, um, we're looking at uh, all funds increase of nearly 10 percent, um, nearly somewhere around 4 billion in uh, new tax revenues uh, being collected. We haven't raised the reserve. Um, and so is there not um, more risk in that we were spending virtually, I mean, we have increased the size of government, the programs, um, you know, certainly you talk about um, that we uh, have more stability, but we also are, have more spending. So. I mean, I think it's a great experiment. I mean, I think we, we've seen what's happened, the, you know, with the last uh, budget and what happened. Now we've done the 180. We'll watch over the next two years uh, to see, um, you know, what the effects of that radical change in fiscal policy is on the health of the state. Uh, but I think there um, are some risks associated with that. 
approach as well. And if we uh, see sequestration uh, continue, um, the federal government we know um, has to do something to deal with their uh, uh, their programs. And uh, many, I don't serve on the tax committee. There's a uh, much uh, uh, more learned experts around the table than I around that, but there's also some speculation on whether or not the projections for revenues based on these new taxes will actually um, show up as well. And so I just like your comment on that. Mr. Schwab. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative, uh, excellent question because you're absolutely right. There is risk um, in the buying income. It is from uncertainty about new things that we're going to do, the impact, um, or how our strategy plays out. That's not necessarily different than the fact that we had risk, the previous biennium or the biennium before. We always have questions and we're always sort of working our way through. From the rating agency perspective, what they appreciate seeing is a balanced approach so that we aren't adding to the risks of having future repayments that we have to do, that we have uh, some predictability about where we're trying to go and what's going to happen next, and appreciate that there's a strategy um, in place. How that plays out, valid question. How, the, how it's going to happen, how it's going to work out. But in terms of some of the risks, I think we're probably looking at a buying in that has less risk, less uncertainty than we did for the last couple of buying in. And that uh, is a good thing. The federal risk is certainly, I think, the pie, the, along with the general economic, there's always general economic uncertainty. But you know, how we interplay with the federal government is a question, absolutely. The one slightly consoling or uh, mitigating factor that I want to bring to bear is that Minnesota is less reliant on federal spending than most other states. We don't have a big military base or a big military presence. We don't do a lot of direct supply uh, for the federal government. We don't even have a lot of federal workers. So the percentage of our GDP in Minnesota is not largely impacted by the federal government. You can't say that for Virginia or Texas or other places. So while there is uncertainty about federal fiscal policy, our direct economic impact is probably going to be significantly less than your average state. But Mr. Speaker, if I might, um, we've heard a lot of uh, stories, uh, certainly uh, attending events in my community. Um, there's been uh, stories in the press about people delaying decisions. Uh, one example, the warehouse uh, tax. Um, when I talk to bankers, accountants, attorneys, um, they tell me anywhere from 30, uh, you know, percent, uh, you know, on the high end, uh, you know, 15 to 30 percent of their clientele are looking for ways to get out of Minnesota or move their business to avoid these uh, higher impacts. Um, there's uh, uh, stories about uh, trying to avoid the cigarette uh, tax, et cetera. If some of these components um, have, isn't there a risk that some of those would have some impact as well on um, we've set this higher spending level and if the revenues or if we see another dip in the recession? Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Representative, sure. Uh, I think there's always trends going in and out and whether they are to tax changes, whether they are to health care uh, changes, whether they are to the availability of skilled workers, all of these things are part major issues. Um, that employers and businesses and individuals are going to have to add up. Uh, Minnesota hasn't been a low cost state for a long time, and the question is how do we you know, make sure we've got the resources to continue growing? And yeah, uh, that's why we'll, we're looking forward to the November forecast and then years after that as well. And if I could, just one other issue as long as that we have you here, and there's been uh, reports about the SWIFT uh, system and the hiccups. Did, I mean, was anybody held accountable? Did anybody lose their job over this big expenditure and the system not being as efficient and wonderful as everybody had hoped? Was there uh, any consequences um, for anybody over this? Uh, Commissioner Schwartz. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative, uh, I, I would actually suggest to you that the news was not nearly as bad as reported. 
Uh, first of all, uh, the SWIFT implementation, uh, yes, it did take a while. It was not news. In fact, it was something that we had disclosed to the legislature last December. Reiterated in hearings last winter. So the notion that SWIFT was off schedule actually is not accurate. We had let people know in a very public manner where we were at all along. Two, it's not abnormal. If you look at other states that have implemented an accounting procurement system like we did, the reporting always lags. It's the last piece. So while regrettable, while troubling, while irritating, and while newsworthy in a slow week, it is not uh, a particularly unpredictable um, or uh, event. And last is that I think the accounting system has already yielded benefits that, you know, last November we talked about the change in processes yielding information that we had under reflected from the Department of Human Services, uh, federal uh, agency. So DHS collected about $139 million more in federal funds than they had thought they would. So I appreciate the concern, but no, I, I, I'm actually quite supportive of the financial reporting team, uh, of the SWIFT implementation team, because it's been done on time, within budget. It's caused problems. It's caused problems for the legislative auditor process. It's caused pro problems for financial reporting and state employees getting used to the system. But uh, I think we're on track and learning so that this doesn't happen again. Yeah, the other uh, question I think that came up, we were actually in New York when uh, these uh, reports were coming about, was that rating agencies, that this was a big risk to the rating agencies, and that is just not true. This is a financial disclosure process, making sure that the federal government, uh, that investors have the information on what our books are. And we will uh, very shortly conclude the single audit, which is the report on the federal funds, and uh, we'll continue to try to improve that process. All along, though, we've been very transparent in helping our partners know at least where we're at. So when, when were we downgraded? Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, we were downgraded uh, by Moody's uh, a, a number of years ago. I'm thinking around four or five years ago. But the two downgrades really happened uh, right around uh, the July 2011 June 2011 time. And what was happening then? Uh, we were working on a, a biennial budget. Okay. So Representative Davis. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And <clears throat> looking at the budget overall, I'm very concerned about that we may have some hidden e-poll tab issues in there where they say we're going to get $70 million and we get, you know, a lot less than that. And referring to the cigarette tax and the warehouse tax that's uh, supposed to go on April 1st. That being said, there, there's one word I'm a little concerned about up there, and it's the last bullet, the first word. Uh, and I would just like a bit of an explanation. Uh, you know, we have a 10 percent increase in the all funds budget, which is the highest spending in state history. We have uh, record property taxes. Property taxes would be at record levels, according to nonpartisan House research. What would it take you to change that word from conservative to liberal? If, if this is conservative, what would it take to be liberal? <laughs> Mr. Chair, uh, uh, Re Representative, the bullet is talking about the substantial work that the state has done for a number of years to repay the ships, whereas you look at other states uh, like Illinois where their gap balance continues to get worse, where they pile up other uh, obligations. It reply refers to uh, the attention that the legislature pays to pensions so that other post-employment benefits, uh, which were even reported very commonly just a handful of years ago, uh, didn't pile up so that once it became commonly known within uh, accounting world, uh, it wasn't a major negative. So I, I, I don't know. Um, I don't have a litmus test on how to do that. But certainly from the rating agencies, having us one step under AAA suggests that they do see that the fiscal practices and the, the discipline that Minnesota goes through in order to decide how it's going to allocate its money and where it's going to go shapes up well. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, and just on that property tax point, I think it is relevant to point out um, 
statewide property taxes in the report you're talking about on existing properties are actually going down by 63 million this year. The reason that they're higher in the report is because we actually have about 75 million dollars in new construction. And when you have new construction, those, that's things that have never been taxed before. But actually property taxes are going down by about 63 million according to that report on existing properties. Uh, if we would have kept the last budget in place and how we dealt with property taxes in the last budget, uh, property tax would be going up 181 million. Uh, so significantly more than they're actually going up under the current uh, situation. Um, they're projected to decrease for homeowners and businesses, uh, in the, and according to the report that Representative Davids was just referring to, um, and in fact, uh, which I think is, is also a good thing, and that doesn't account for any of the direct property tax relief that we actually included, the expansion of the circuit breaker, that's not even counted into those, uh, into those numbers. Uh, so overall tax reductions are projected to be about three r reductions, tax reductions and property taxes are projected to be about 3% in greater Minnesota, about a percent and a half in the metro area. So I, I think those are actually good things, and I, j I just couldn't let that comment go by Representative Davids without actually getting the facts out there. Mr. Speaker, I do have the facts, and you said a lot of it's having to do with manufacture. I look at uh, agricultural property going up 6.5 percent. I'm not aware that we've manufactured new agricultural property. I'm not sure about that. But the rest of it is going up because of new construction. I didn't say manufactured. So Representative uh, Senator Han. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, Commissioner, thank you for your presentation. I, one of the comments you made a moment ago uh, uh, just provokes in my mind a question. You talked about some of the risk involved uh, going forward, and you mentioned that for Minnesota maybe our risk is a little bit mitigated by the fact that we don't have a lot of connection to the uh, situation going on at the federal government. And I think we all recognize that there's a huge problem in Washington, and maybe the further away we get from it, the better. But you, you mentioned that we don't have uh, uh, large military bases or other things that would tie us close to that. But we do have a significant amount of money that comes in from the federal government. We have the all funds budget takes in a lot of federal dollars. Can you tell us what percentage of our uh, all funds budget is federal dollars and how that has changed in the last few bienniums? Commissioner Showalter. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator, I can't off the top. Uh, unfortunately, Representative Holbrook has a consolidated statement, so she's ahead of me, although one is appearing to my right. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, you're right. Uh, all funds uh, dollars uh, come from a number of different places. Uh, federal funds is about 30% uh, of uh, the estimated 2014-15 um, um, all funds budget. That is slightly larger um, than it was just a couple of years ago in percentage terms. Mr. Speaker. Uh, Senator Hamm. Uh, when you say slightly larger, uh, do we have any? Oh, and why? Pardon me. I'm sorry. Uh, slightly larger uh, from the previous biennium. From the, I mean, what, what, what are we? I guess I'm just looking for what kind of growth pattern are we on here with our commitment to fund our spending by federal dollars? Sure. Uh, this is going from November uh, 2012. Uh, and looking at fiscal years 2012 and 13, so we're switching fiscal years and times that the snapshot's being taken. Going to end of session 2013, looking at the 14-15 biennium. So you know, it, these are this is a potpourri of numbers, uh, but it's basically going from about 28 percent, 28 and a half percent of our all funds budget in 12 and 13 to about 30.5 percent in 14 and 15. Uh, certainly, where's that? Uh, where's the biggest growth factor? Uh, I would assume, off the top of my head, as probably you would, uh, that uh, changes in health care reimbursement uh, would likely be driving that figure. Uh, transportation is also a big uh, driving factor in those numbers. Okay, and we may be getting more of that later on in the okay. agenda too. Representative Loeffler and Senator uh, Newman, and then we're going to move on. So, Representative oh, Loeffler. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and um, welcome, Dr. Um, Colum. Call them boquitas. We have to all practice that. Thank you for, for joining our team. Um, what struck me in, in the graphs that you gave us that um, in chart 11, how our, you know, we've been hearing over and over again that we're ahead of the national level in, uh, in terms of employment. But this really says, you know, it's been two going on three years that we've been at 2.4 percent or at least for sure a solid 2 percent above the national average. And is that going to 
to play into the forecast that you're, you're doing as you adjust the, the Global Insight numbers as well? Or do you look at it more by sector by sector as opposed to overall um, work participation? Mr. Chairman, um, members of the committee, uh, I, as I said before, we do look at this sector by sector. And so we are looking at the projections for the national economy with regard to um, in industry by industry and what's happening with regard to jobs and wages. And then we look at which sectors are um, uh, particularly important for Minnesota. And so there could be something that's happening on a national level that is of less importance to us, for instance, the sequester, or there could be something that is not as significant on the national level but that we have to focus on a great deal here. So um, we make projections with regard to uh, wages and income and jobs. And then uh, we, we then we have to figure out how or project how much taxes people are going to pay as a consequence of, of those changes, and then finally when they're going to pay them. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that's helpful. I just didn't understand exactly how the the forecast gets put together, but I, this track record just is such a a startling change from the past history that you've showed us that I I was hoping we'd get credit, and we do by the each sector. Senator Newman. Mr. Speaker, uh, Commissioner Schwalter, uh, I want to go back to the, to the area or the arena regarding the accounting system. Um, the, the report that just came out from OLA was uh, you know, somewhat critical of the, of the state's new accounting system. And when I read or I'm looking at the consolidated fund statement that MMB prepared, it, uh, it talks in terms of on the third page that the consolidated fund statement is uh, the first prepared reporting financial activity from the state's new accounting system. And I guess just give me your thoughts as to um, given the trouble reported by the Office of uh, Legislative Auditor regarding the accounting system, and this report is now based on that new accounting system, how cautious do we have to be when we are reading through this consolidated fund statement? How, how I, I'm going to assume that there's a danger of it being somewhat inaccurate given the problem with the accounting system. Just your thoughts, Commissioner. Commissioner Showalter. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator, it, the state has an unqualified opinion from the Office of Legislative Auditor on its comprehensive financial statements. We have prepared the usual statements that are late, and we own that at MMB. We completely own that. Uh, the implementation of the system, understanding new routines, new reports, new reporting tools even, to collect that data are responsible for that delay. The veracity of the information, the truthfulness of the information is still there, is very much there, and we feel very confident, we feel completely standing behind the information that we've had presented both in the fund balance information that you have there, knowing that there's always work that is being done, but the underlying accounting system is solid. It's passed. Uh, you know, we've already issued financial statements which have been audited, have an unqualified opinion, and we continue to expect to make this system work better for the states that you get different and better information and better access to information. And uh, I think that's that's where we're at. Uh, I would not uh, suggest to you that you should take any kind of hedge on the numbers or the work that uh, is done in state agencies uh, to account for this taxpayer dollars. Uh, it's accounted for. It's known what's happening. And what you're talking about is sort of the delays in figuring out what are the reports, this very specific, particular reports that occur on an annual basis. Mr. Speaker, uh, Commissioner, just a real quick follow-up then. The numbers that are con t contained in your consolidated fund statement are accurate, uh, but, uh, but there was just a delay in the reporting. Is it, have I got that straight? Commissioner Shaw. Mr. Chair, Senator, uh, the accounting system deals with things that have happened. It deals with uh, fiscal years 12 and now fiscal year 13 spending and revenues. And yes, th that information is accurate. That is the basis that we use to sort of start doing the projections based upon legislation uh, that uh, from this end of, end of session uh, statement. Thank you, Commissioner. And thank all of you for being here today. We appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Marks and Mr. Nauman, I'm not sure.
That's it. Yep. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, members, we're, uh, we're going to mix the next, the next two items on the agenda. We're going to not really make a distinction between them and just uh, uh, I think you have in your packets the materials that uh, Mr. Nauman and I are going to go through and uh, um, we will try to get the same chart. They're pretty much in the correct order. We may jump around a little bit. Uh, we're going to, we'll try to get the same charts up here. Uh, this first chart, uh, which is uh, labeled General Fund Tracking, House Governor Senate, uh, it's actually not House Governor Senate on here anymore. It's the Conference Committee as compared to uh, previous biennial and the forecast for uh, 14, 15, and 16, 17. Uh, but this is, this is a summarized version of the, the general fund tracking that we were using at, uh, at the end of session. Uh, and this is, uh, uh, it's, it's basic, it's arranged by the conference committee structure. Uh, it has uh, the columns on here, 2010-11 spending, 2012-13 uh, spending, uh, uh, the February forecast for 14-15, then the conference committee numbers for 14-15. And then for 1617, the forecast and conference committee numbers. Um, I won't spend a lot of time on the individual categories. If you flip over to the back side of the page, uh, you can see the, uh, um, the the total spending, the revenue change numbers, and the balances. Uh, and just to point out that uh, after all the adjustments, uh, fiscal 1415 ends up with a $46 million balance uh, that uh, uh, um, uh, as far as uh, more revenue raised than spent in fiscal 14, 15. Uh, and I would also point out that if nothing changed from the end of session numbers, this 46 million in the November forecast would be available for shift reduction. Uh, and then in 16, 17, a balance of 735 million. If the, if the 46 million was from the first biennium was added to it, it's 781. Uh, so those are basically the, the, the kind of the summary of the end of session tracking numbers. Uh, that uh, uh, we have uh, from the end of session. Then we're going to jump to uh, basically looking at spending and revenue numbers from the, uh, uh, and there, we're matching up with MMB's uh, fund balance numbers. I just want to mention a couple things here that are differences. Uh, in our end of session tracking, uh, and it's primarily the tax committee issues, the, the tax committee made a number of appropriations in the K-12 education area. Also made some appropriations. Uh, I think about two million for uh, uh, in the to the Department of uh, Employment and Economic Development, and then some appropriations to administration and revenue departments. When we go to the fund balance numbers, those those appropriations are moved to uh, the education ones to the education area, the uh, uh, the deed ones to the jobs area, the admin administration and revenue ones are moved to the state government area to line up with the, where those agencies are. So. So there's some differences in the, uh, in, in the tracking uh, when we go to these end of session numbers. This, this first chart up here, general fund spending end of session, uh, and this is actually, uh, uh, we put six biennia here, uh, going back to, to 2006, 2007. These are all, all these spending accounts are now arranged by the 2013 conference committee structure, so the numbers across the biennia are comparable. And you can see the, uh, the, the spending changes by area and by total for the uh, um, uh, for the the each of the biennia and for all the areas within the biennia. Uh, I won't spend any more time on this unless you have questions uh, in the interest of getting through all of this. But if there are, if there are any questions, uh, um, there are totals on here and so on. So. Okay. So why don't we go and then if people. We certainly can come back and give us questions after they look at the Okay, then the, the next chart here is general fund revenue. And this, this again is arranged the same way as the last one. It's six biennia starting with 2006, 2007. Um, you, you don't look at these numbers at all, as often. Uh, these are fund balance or numbers from MMB's fund balance as well, but they're rather than arranged by committee type structure, they're, they're the major types of revenue. The first grouping on here is what's called tax revenues. The second grouping are non-tax revenues. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the tax revenue area is considerably bigger than the non-tax area. Uh, again, there are uh, totals for the biennia and the cha dollar change from biennium to biennium and percent change. 
Um, again, if there are questions, then we can take those uh, I, um, on this particular one. If so what, what falls in that fines and surcharges line? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, the fines and surcharges area would, uh, well, an example would be surcharges on, on certain penalties, for example, fines as opposed to, as opposed to uh, uh, a fee for doing something, what's cons what would be considered a fine if there's a, um, um, the, for example, the share of a, uh, of a uh, speeding ticket, I, I can't remember if the state gets a share of a speeding ticket, but, but there are certain kinds of fines like that where the state gets a share of that. Uh, there are specific surcharges on certain of those kinds of fines that would also be in this category. Uh, the, the one right above that, departmental earnings, would include all the fees. So uh, it would be fees going into the general fund in this particular case. But a, a fee, for example, the, the barber's licenses or the architects or the accountants are all within the general fund. So the, their licensing fees would be examples within that category. Fees are actually less? In the next bank, and then the last bank? Uh, these are slightly less. Um, that's probably. See, where are the reporters now? Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, well, not so we can just the the <laughs> <laughs> uh, You know, the, and it may be a case where some of the fees may have been moved out of the general fund. I can think of an example where there's a fee moved out of the general fund into another fund, for example. But uh, <laughs> well, and um, on the <laughs> cigarette. Is that what's going on there? Well, in the, in the cigarette area, the uh, this is this is one that's a little bit complicated. This um, these changes in the cigarette uh, tax this year. Part of it was to to repeal that cigarette fee and include that within the tax. Okay. Mm. The cigarette fee is not shown in here in the fee area because it was a fee that went into a uh, the health impact fund a non-general fund area, and then it was transferred to the general fund. It actually shows up in the next to the bottom line in transfers from other funds. And you can see that transfers from other funds drops considerably in fiscal 14-15, and that's because we're no longer making that transfer from the health impact fund into the general fund. Okay. So it, it, this gets a little bit uh, where it's not real comparable because the cigarette fee Looks, well, it goes up three, from 379 million to a, a billion 195, but within that, the cigarette fee is being repealed, and that shows up down in the transfers from other funds. Okay. All right. So the, the cigarette tax actually didn't go up by that amount. It that is not that's correct. Uh, I mean, it depends on whether you want to argue technicalities of fees and taxes and so on. <laughs> so. Let's do general, general fund fines. Yeah, yeah. you can operate that. Okay. So, Mr. Chair and members, um, working through your packet now, then there's a, the next grouping of packets is, a, is the series of pie charts. These are the documents that are traditionally prepared by uh, the uh, Department of Management and Budget, and I'll just kind of work you through them. It's a, it, we're going to start with the general fund. It's uh, of course, the largest of all of our funds, and the first pie chart, and again, I'll work through this quickly unless you pause me for questions. Um, the first chart looks at where does the money in the general fund come from. So you can see that blue piece is the, the income tax. So this is taking a similar look at um, the same types of data, but portrays it graphically so that you can see the percentage of the general fund is is dominated um, by the individual income tax as the largest uh, collection source, and then the sales tax um, follows on uh, as the next largest piece. The next slide, and we'll end up doing this for 1415 and 1617, so I'll just concentrate on 1415. The, the pies exist for uh, we baked a lot of pie in the last couple of days, um, and uh, I'll, I'll just concentrate on the 1415 biennium. But the next way to look at this is by budget area, essentially the committee jurisdictions, and where does the money go? And from a general fund perspective, it's, it's a tried and true uh, truism in, in Minnesota that the largest piece of the general fund is the K-12 education. Um, it's at 41.2% it's at uh, for the 1415 biennium, and, and human services is just a touch below 30%. Those, those are the largest budget areas, and the percentages for the other jurisdictions are, are there for your information. Do you know how these compare? Uh, 
over time. Um, Mr. Chair, um, we'll have a, yeah, I think what I would say is historically that tends to be about, about right. I've seen K-12 as low as 37%, but that was in a, in a year when we were doing a fair bit of shifting and, and, the, and the appropriations were depressed. So I think it bops around about that historical average. It's been about the 40% level since 2001, 2002 when the state took over more of the education right. funding. So then the next way, um, I think the next one that I, well, the next chart, the next chart begins the 1617 biennium for the general fund, and it's the, the same information presented. There's information, questions I can, I can attempt to deal with those. Okay, so Mr. Chair, the next grouping of pies, um, as I said, the bakers were busy, um, is looks at the um, all funds. So this gets at some of the questions that Senator Han was asking about um, with the previous presenters. And, and here we have the, the 12, 13, and 14, 15 biennium for the all funds budget. And Bill, I do it. I'm getting there. <laughs> yep, sorry. Just want to make sure I don't get ahead of you. I think that's probably it. And I think it's double clicked in this. Is that right? Okay, so with respect to the, the all funds, we're going to look at um, this in essentially three different ways. Um, in the first, in the first slide that you have in front of you, we're looking at the, the basically the total, the spending side. How much of the, how much of the all funds is general fund budget? And you can see that's about 55 percent. The healthcare access fund in the human services area gets talked about a lot. It's about 1.1 percent in the 12-13 biennium as measured at the end of session. Um, the federal fund, Senator Han asked about that. In this example, 26.5 percent. Bill, can we flip to the next slide? Sorry. So now we take the same data and look at it by budget jurisdiction. So previously it was by fund. Now you're ignoring the funds and looking at it by budget jurisdiction. As we talked about before, K-12, and this is, Mr. Speaker, you spoke about the historical average. This trend is holds true for as long as I can recall. Maybe Bill has a longer memory, but uh, he probably does. Um, health and Human Services and K-12 flip when you begin looking at it as a percent of the all funds budget. So now Health and Human Services constitutes 47% and K-12 drops down to a little less than 30%. And the dynamic there, of course, is the preponderance of federal funds um, and the, the payments that come directly from the federal government for the for the human services budget that is just over, overwhelms the size of the K-12 budget. And then the other budget areas are, are shown there. Then I think the last slide that we will show you on the pies is going to be where the revenue comes from. <coughs> and that's this slide here. So Senator Han, you asked about the federal grants um, in, now we're showing it at 28.4% of the all funds revenue being collected. Um, the individual income tax at 26.9, um, the sales tax at 16.3. Again, I stress that these, this is all funds. This is, not, this is not the general fund budget. So this gives you a sense of where the revenues are collected from, inter, from the roughly $62 billion of revenue on an all funds operating basis. And so um, that, that constitutes all the pies. I think we have a few others, but they are redundant. It begins to move into the 14-15 biennium. So um, again, if there's questions, then we can deal with that. Maybe the next piece that I'd like to call your attention to is a chart that Bill and I put together that took that pie information on a revenue basis. We just did the revenues for the purposes of this meeting. Um, and looked at it at the November forecast, what were the percentages? And again, what we've done is stack them as opposed to use to bake pie with them. Um, so now you can see that um, at the very bottom, the individual income tax for the November forecast for fiscal 14, 15, 13, 14, 12, 13 was 26.8%. Then at the end of session, it was also measured at 26.9%. 26 then you look at November forecast for the 14-15 budget, the individual income tax was 26.5, 
and the 1415 and the session number is now 27.2. So that percentage reflects what the legislature did. So they, there were income tax increases in the last mm -hmm. session, and we think that this graphically displays across time, or at least since the November forecast for these two, for these two biennial, what, what occurred. Um, the federal grants, these are the data that the commissioner spoke to you about, Senator Han. I'll also call your attention to, since cigarette taxes were a component of the discussion in this last session, that sixth or seventh line uh, grouping down, it's sort of a teal color. It's 4.7 all the way on the left. That's where the cigarette taxes are located. So it was 4.7 in, in November for 1213, 4.6 for uh, end of session for 1213. But now you can see the dynamic for November versus end of session um, in, in uh, the 14-15 biennium. That's where the cigarette taxes come online. You can see it going from 4.8% to 5.8%. You also see a similar dynamic that there's a, there's a little bit of change in the corporate, um, corporate income tax going from 3% in 14-15 November to 3.5% in 14-15 uh, for end of session. And again, these are all relative to each other. It just gives you a sense of um, what percentage, um, after everything's said and done, have you substantially changed the overall uh, percentage of a, a particular tax within the overall revenue collections of the state. Yeah, uh, going back to the uh, federal funds, and in fact, I was at a meeting with Mr. Marks the other day and I asked a question about the flow of federal dollars and how they're calculated. Um, we could look at either the pie chart or maybe it's more relevant with this last chart here. Uh, is this showing now all the federal funds that come into the state? And to give you a couple of examples, um, financial aid for students, uh, the Higher Education Services Office, I wasn't sure at the time how those dollars are tracked, whether they go to the Higher Education Services Office and then are dispersed, or if they go directly to the colleges and universities and then are dispersed uh, in one form or another to the students. That would be one question. The other is uh, school districts sometimes receive dollars from the federal government go to Department of Ed then to the school district, sometimes school districts apply for and those dollars go directly to the school district. So my question is basically, are we showing all federal funds coming into the state uh, or or not with, with this pie chart or so this Mr. Chair, uh, Representative draft? Carlson, I'll take a first stab at this and and, and, um, and, and Bill can back me up if, if I miss something. I think the way to think about this is um, that th this chart would show, the first answer is no, it doesn't show all the all the federal funds coming in. Typically what we're showing here is the federal funds that essentially are going through the state treasury. Mm -hmm. To the extent that there are dollars like Head Start that go directly to, uh, that don't go through the, that don't go to straight state treasury and go to a, a separate recipient, they would not be tracked in this chart. This shows the dollars that the, the state is managing through it, it, its treasury. Then very quick, Mr. Chairman, a follow-up, do we, in the end, know the answer to the question of how many federal dollars ultimately come in. Is there some sort of a reporting mechanism or or not? And if you don't know the answer to that now, um, I'm not looking for what that number would be. Just the question is, do we know? Mr. Chair uh, and Representative Carlson, I don't think we do. Uh, I don't think we, uh, we would ha we could perhaps find it, but I don't think we have an easy way to get that number because uh, a couple, the Head Start numbers, for example, we could get. Uh, another example would be University of Minnesota gets a lot of federal money that doesn't that goes directly to the university yep. doesn't go through the state treasury. Um, I, I yeah, that'd be especially could, true with their research. Yeah, I expect yep. we could probably get that. Your your question on financial aid, the consolidated fund statement is only showing the Office of Higher Ed spending about five and a half million a year of federal money. So I I don't think financial aid is showing up in these numbers at all as well because I think that money goes basically directly to students. So. Uh, or to, it, to those who receive it. So I don't believe that's in here either. Uh, and, and the other example you mentioned of you know, where, an, where a school district or a city or a county or somebody applies directly for a federal grant, and if they get that grant and it does not come through the state in any way, it doesn't come through 
the Department of Education or, or some other state agency. It's not going to be in these numbers that we have here. So uh, uh, we, could, we could attempt to find the number, but I don't think we readily, have it readily available on the federal money. And Mr. Chairman, I'm not asking them to do that now. I just want to know if it was actually, actually Mr. So. Chair, we may be able to get that number through the Federal Funds Information Service at the federal level. I don't think we have a state source of it. Thank you. Did you have your hand? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I'm wondering if, uh, and uh, as far as this chart is concerned, um, the percentages. Maybe I'm missing the boat on why the percentages are important here, and you, you can maybe comment on that. Um, to me, they don't mean a whole lot. I would rather just see the dollar amounts, and I can see the dollar amount at the bottom for the total. And I suppose I could take my calculator and calculate that all out. But do you have this in a in terms of just? Raw dollar amount. It, did I receive that, Mr. Mr. Chair? I, I didn't want to overwhelm you with paper. There was a lot of paper in front of you, um, so Representative, I'd be happy to provide the, okay. the supporting data to you. Um, I'll, I'll tell you that it does have some. We had hoped this morning to show this afternoon to show you the spending side, but we found a technical issue that we weren't we're working with MMB on. That's built into this sheet, so if I give you a copy of that, I give you that caution as well. Okay. But, but we can get we can get the numbers behind this graph to you. Very easy. And then, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Speaker, um, are you, will you provide the spending side as well in a similar format? Or? Um, Mr. Chair, um, can I offer a suggestion with respect to that? We, as I said, we would have liked to have done that. When we work that out, um, I just think that there was a, there's a, just an inconsistency in a data set. Maybe we can provide it to the committee and it can be distributed. Yeah, we'll, okay. we'll send it out once, on the, on the okay. spending side, yeah. once that gets Thank figured you. out. Absolutely. Uh, S Senator Bach and then Senator Han. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. M Mr. Marks or Mr. Nalman, whichever one. The, the numbers that we see from time to time that show the amount of federal dollars that come back to Minnesota per capita, which is, I think, kind of where we look like an outlier, mm -hmm. is, is does that include all the federal dollars? We're not making that calculation. The federal government is or somebody. So does that number that show us 49th or 50th in, per capita <laughs> in federal money coming back, or does that include all the other sources like the community block grants and the Head Start and the money to the University of Minnesota? Mr. Chair and Senator Bach, uh, yes. And, and I think that I know one source of that money is the Federal Funds Information Service, again, that, uh, that I had mentioned before. And we can get we can, uh, a lot of their information is, is estimates, but I think they're pretty good estimates. And we can get that information uh, from them as well. Senator uh, Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, Appreciate the interest in the federal dollars that are going into the state budget. It seems to be an interesting topic here for the committee. But, uh, uh, Mr. Nell, I'm just going back to your pie charts here. The uh, totally uh, all funds uh, where the dollars come from. Two charts looking at end of 2013 uh, for the I guess the 2012-13 uh, uh, biennium and then the 14-15 biennium. Kind of the comparison of the two where the dollars come from, those two charts. You've got two. And you're showing there, the, the one is the federal grants is about 28.4% of the total uh, source. And then in the 14-15 uh, biennium, it's 30.5, uh, which is about a 7% growth rate, an increase in dollars. If, I mean, that, that's, that's the percentage growth from one biennium to the next and as a source. Um, we look at income taxes, which is the second biggest chunk, 26.9, 27.2, so some growth, but not as much. We talk about the income tax being the biggest funder of state spending. Obviously, that's not true. The federal source, in terms of the total budget, is the biggest source of spending uh, and growing, apparently, the most rapidly. Um, I have some concern about that. I don't know about the rest of the legislature, but I do. Uh, how does this compare, do you know, to what other states are experiencing? Is this normal? Is this abnormal? Are other states doing the same thing? Is it, are we faster, slower, average? Do, do we know? I, Mr. Mr. Chair and Senator Hand, I don't know off the top okay. of my head. Um, I think we could do a little digging and, and I'd I mean, be curious. There, are, there are organizations such as NCSL that could provide us with 
with those kinds of historical data? Well, Mr. Speaker, and I uh, appreciate your patience with this, but I would, uh, uh, Mr. Dalman, I'd just be, just be curious to know. Sure. Uh, I, I know other states do things differently than we do, but uh, I, I do uh, think that we ought to be concerned about having a significant and growing portion of our state spending be dependent on federal uh, largesse that I believe is very uncertain. And uh, uh, I think that it should be a cause of concern, and if we're going to go forward, we maybe want to rethink that. So just to clarify, so you want to understand the growth in federal alliance in Minnesota relative to other states? Mr. Speaker, And we can yes. spend some time on the next hearing. Just, just would, I'm trying to, okay. Mr. Speaker, yes. I just would like to know if we're kind of uh, doing what everybody else is doing or whether we're an outlier one way or the other. Okay. And one other thing, oh, the spending thing. I got you. Yep. Yeah. All right. Uh, Representative Dow. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And just a, a follow-up to my earlier question. Maybe the numbers are in this this handout with all the pies you've been baking. Um, it looks like those numbers actually correlate to this. Is that correct? Um, Mr. Chair, uh, Representative, they do. Yes. In fact, what we did to create the, the revenue of that was just simply take the, the pie charts that you have in your left hand over time, some other pie charts that, we, that weren't in the packet, and plot those data on the chart. We originally thought that that might be an easier way than having you flip through all the pies um, so that you could compare them stack next to each other. Uh, Mr. Speaker, if I may. Yeah, let's see, Representative Doan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, it, I'll explain my earlier comment, too, about the, the percentages never made a lot of sense to me. I don't care so much about that because you, when you look at this one, uh, which is, I guess isn't the one you have up there anymore, but the, the, the bar graph style, um, and you see the percentages, it looks like it's been very consistent. But when you look at the numbers on the bottom, you can see that each one of those segments has grown uh, quite a bit. So the dollar amounts um, sure. have increased uh, uh, quite a bit from one biennium to the next. So um, that's why, to me, this is a bit misleading. But um, Well, Mr. Mr. Chair, Representative, our intent was not to, certainly right. not to mislead. <laughs> of to course. Yeah. A, a, <laughs> I think with that this, this, uh, this chart that I now put back up, gives you a sense of the relative magnitude of each of the individual income sources as a percent of the total uh, Minnesota All Funds budget, where the revenue comes from over time. Um, and it's a very short time, admittedly, but I think the members might observe that we made some decisions on the tax side in the last session, and that as a result of having made that decision, the question becomes, what did the, how did those revenue sources change the overall, the overall revenue picture um, since we last did a forecast? And of course, we are showing November here. We didn't have the data for February. Right. Yeah, and, so, and maybe to get to Senator Han's point, is doing this bar chart just kind of for the country, right? And I don't know if there's a way to get to that, but seeing how those percentages com compare, that would give you some insight into that, I suppose. And I don't know if that's possible we'll, to do. But we'll check what sort of data we can get NCSA, on that. Yeah. And I, um, I, getting the federal funds alone is would not be difficult. Getting federal funds as part of a state budget might be more of a challenge. But. Uh, okay. Any further questions, people have? Mr. Speaker. Yes, Senator. Um, I just wanted to say, if you're looking for ideas for future sessions that we could talk about pension policy, that would be. It's in the news a lot, and I think it might be useful for the committee to get an update from both our investments um, with Mr. Be Becker, Bicker, and also from the funds, mm -hmm. fund directors. All right, we'll do that. So our next meeting is going to be uh, in August, August 21st, which is a Wednesday. And that meeting, I think, will spend a lot of, well, some of the time at least, again, um, looking at... Um, task forces and commissions in the executive branch and we'll try to get information out in advance so that people can take a little bit of look and see if there's some overlap because one of our charges is to see if some of those are not necessary anymore. Uh, so that'll be the start of that process. Uh, but if people do have other ideas, as Senator Pappas raised, please let me know. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Oh, yeah. Chair, do you, are you expecting a late day meeting again on the I hope, no, at 9 a.m. I'm hoping. Early, yes. Okay. Yeah. Two -hour, time for a two-hour meeting? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yes, it's up to you, really. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we are adjourned. Not you.